from birth uh, motherhood. I, I, so there are so many points here that I, I, I don't want to sort of go into too much detail. One tiny little point with regard to one of the things that was inferred in the documentary, which seemed to suggest that Britain was less culpable uh, than perhaps America or some continental European countries. Um, have a look at the history of the British Empire. Have a look at how it's dealt with minorities, or not, no, sorry, majorities, majorities in, in, in Asia, in India in particular, in Kenya, in its African empire. Also have a look at how it treated Ireland in the 19th yeah. century. No, have a look how the Irish were depicted. I, I, know, I, know, I know that wasn't... I, I know about the yeah. uh, Irish Holocaust yeah. Uh, yeah. by the British. Genocide. Yeah. Uh, so I know yep. uh, about uh, about it, but uh, the film, uh, well, uh, this uh, remark, it uh, uh, concerned uh, uh, passing through legislature this uh, uh, forced uh, sterilization uh, law. So it never happened in, in uh, Britain, but, but of course uh, it doesn't uh, make uh, the British look better than they actually look. But it did yeah. happen in the empire, in, yeah. in the, yeah. the empire, as it were, yeah. the outline which yeah. is, of course, where the British <laughs> wanted to make sure that they had exerted control. And, and Margaret Sang herself used to come over to Britain and hang out here. Yeah, well, you know, sometimes for two years, sometimes for a summer. Seminars. Uh, yeah, and, and she used to have her own, own group of friends, including Bertrand <coughs> Russell and all these sorts of people. Well, after all, uh, 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 Sir Francis Galton and, uh, and his cousin Darwin, uh, Darwin, uh, well, they were British. <laughs> There's a, something that you said yeah. Um, yeah. that I'd just like to maybe extend a little bit. There's a movement in, uh, I, the first time I heard of it was in France. And it's this idea, you know, in, 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 in our countries, if someone is sick, they get help. You know, no one in the hospital says, well, you smoked, therefore we're not going to help you with lung cancer because it's your own fault. You know, that, that thing. But in fact, that sort of change, and again, this comes again from a, a social principle, uh, one that would have been certainly identified as a Catholic social principle, but a Christian social principle of the prioritizing of the vulnerable. So if you're sick, we don't really ask questions about how it happened. You know, that's not important to the fact that we prioritize giving you help. Yeah. And that's a, a very important principle that many of our health systems were based on. But there were changes beginning to happen, uh, you know, over since, since really the, in this millennium, where I know France was beginning to have this thing about, well, if you smoke, then you can't expect the taxpayer to help you when you get sick. You know, this just beginning to erode that. But where it's really come to a head is in the Netherlands, in this context. And the, the decoupling from your neediness, your vulnerability, and, and our response to that, to a value judgment on why you're vulnerable. And it really comes in now with infanticide, and with uh, eugenic abortion. And the impression, the, the thing that a parent, you know, where mothers almost invariably in the Netherlands are scanned now for abnormalities, you know, tests yeah. are taken, yeah. cells are taken. They're very, very keen. And I, I, when I was in Brussels, I was working with the, um, the spinal bifida, the European spinal bifida group, which actually was based in the Netherlands because that's where the big fight was. And if your child is identified as having spinal bifida or Down syndrome, these are the easily identifiable or something, something else. The attitude was growing. And the fear, um, you know, at the time when they were working with me on trying to highlight this, was that policy, not law, but in Netherlands it becomes policy first, law, then it becomes decriminalized, and then finally it becomes law, but you've been doing it for a decade at that stage. The idea is that we've told you to get rid of this child. Yeah. Now, if you decide to keep this child against mm. all of our pressure You're over the weeks and weeks and weeks, <laughs> don't be coming to us for services. Don't expect the taxpayer, this is your hobby, 
This is as if you decided to have a, an awkward dog or something. It's your problem. And that that is growing in policy in, in the Netherlands, that you don't come back. If we identified a problem and you didn't cooperate, don't look for help well, from this us. This is the welfare state at its best. <laughs> it is not uh, uh, an exception, uh, some, some unpleasant incident, it is a result. <laughs> well, that's right, and to the point that now half of infant deaths, in 2005 a study was done in the Netherlands and in 2006 in Belgium, and in both countries it came out the same, that half of infant deaths before the first year of life, before the first birthday, were either passive or active euthanasia. Yeah. In Norway, uh, the same nurse could come to her place of work, to some hospital, uh, before noon to, uh, to treat a prematurely born baby and to save its life. Right, <laughs> and uh, uh, past uh, uh, three p.m., uh, she's uh, uh, the same nurse <laughs> is killing uh, such babies. The same, mm. <laughs> the same, right? The, and uh, both is legal. And there, are, well, this is not uh, my invention, mm. but it is. It is a real problem that uh, some uh, uh, Norwegian. Uh, nurses face, right? <laughs> that they they feel uh, kind of uneasy <laughs> in this situation. Uh, saving lives uh, uh, before noon and, uh, and killing lives uh, past noon, right? For the same salary. <laughs> and of course, and of course, everybody uh, who would uh, say, uh, I don't want to serve such horrible services uh, would be uh, blamed for uh, for denying uh, people services mm. they are being uh, promised by the state mm. so the very moment we engage our state into giving us something we project a situation in which the same state will come back and take away <laughs> what it what it gave right so the only solution is to fight socialism <laughs> is to get rid, is to get away, is to escape uh, the welfare state, which, which, well, it, it Hitler also, uh, you know, he produced uh, Volkswagen, a promise for every every German family, right, to have their own car. Uh, he uh, he uh, designed, well, made. His designers designed uh, highways for <laughs> Volkswagens. Uh, uh, so, uh, and he he uh, 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 reduced uh, unemployment <laughs> in Germany. Before 1939, everything looked nice, uh, even for uh, for uh, 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 Colonel uh, Stauffenberg. Everything was perfect in Germany before, well, 1942. <laughs> There's a lady back there. Uh, get my driver, as I'm not, I have my legs anymore. And may I say the last word? Um, <laughs> I want to tell you all that our Blessed Mother, in 1917, she, she said to the three little children, holding up the rosary, you pray and I save. And if the people don't turn back to God, that fall, fire will fall from the heavens. You see at the moment there in North Vietnam what they're going to, they were saying about America that they were going to send a guided missile. But uh, she, she also uh, asked because she, her heart is broken for the rosary and so uh, for the, her, her children. And she asked this uh, woman to go to America and uh, to have a place there where people could go in and pray. And she, she, uh, gave, her, she gave this rosary. In this rosary, you see the little babies inside in the rosary. And that rosary has to go uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, what was to, to uh, Mexico for to make it. So, I mean, even for that, that's nine euros. But with that rosary, um, uh, the, uh, her son granted that 50 babies would be saved every time it is set. Well, now things are getting so bad 
that she asked if every person said one rosary a day, that you would save one baby with every rosary you say, and say, Celestial Queen, with this rosary, we bind all sinners, that's all the people who are aborting the babies, and all nations, every nation that's doing it, to your Immaculate Heart. And after 10 Hail Marys say, Jesus, protect and save the unborn. It is as simple as that, and you can save one baby every day. So we must pray. The point is that no matter what we do, if this comes in, we still have to keep praying for to save the babies that they continue to abort in until the good Lord takes over. And I mean, you can see with the way the weather has changed and everything, he is very, very angry with the world, and especially because the baby, the, the genocide, is the greatest of all. The greatest of all. And you remember in Mexico, when uh, there, the Antiquas, and they were making sacrifice to their babies. And then all of a sudden, our Blessed Mother appeared to this, uh, this um, man. He, he was up in the mountains. And he, she, she, she said, you go with this cape, put it down on the ground, and then put it, uh, bring it and fold it up. And there were uh, there was roses put into the in, she put little roses yeah. into the flock into the cave. Bring it up and ask for um, a sanctuary to be made up there to uh, uh, for our <coughs> blessed for, for our, our lady. Anyway, he did that, and when he opened that, and the bishop wouldn't believe him, he saw in the eyes of this uh, this uh, um, shepherd he saw saw our blessed mother inside in the eyes, and it was they were converted. The, those, they were pagan, God loves, and they were making sacrifice to the babies. The same thing is happening today. They're sacrificed, the babies are being sacrificed throughout the world. So we must pray. But if we can do all your marvelous. All you said today, no, this is all true. I have seen it, I'm 80 years of age, I've seen it on the, on the, on the papers, I've seen all this happening as, as you have said. But we must pray also. Because until, until something, until the Lord has done something about it, and the situation here in Ireland, you see, the doctors are very good there now, the greater majority of them. But you see, the government, then they have the final word. And this, this is the sad part of it. And inside them, there are good people in the government, but there's a lot of them, and they just, they're not interested in God anymore. And this is what we have to do, we have to keep praying. This is the one, one thing. So I have said my little piece now, and now you can carry on again. You're great. God bless you. Bye. Good night. God bless you. Thank you. I would like first to agree that prayer means a lot. Uh, I went for a vigil on, on 19, uh, January this year, along with 40,000 Irish people and uh, foreigners, whatever, any people uh, to say they don't want, they don't want abortion, not in our name, as we repeated over there. Uh, I'm surprised and I wonder how things are working in Ireland uh, because um, those people who use the case of late uh, Savita, they managed to gather 2,000 people in vigil. And then when 40,000 people are coming, and this is number um, according to Legion of Mare, which I guess could be right because that was event uh, for one and a half hour, people were coming from all over Ireland um, Gardi said first there were initially 20,000 people, then they said uh, they are 25. At the end of the meeting, they counted 35,000, but of course, there could be some people coming late. Um, so uh, I will disagree with lady who was speaking uh, before me that the last word belongs to government. As um, Mr. Grzegorz Brown um, often said about Poland-Polish history, he will know very well that solidarity, it was not one Mr. Lev Valensa, who by the way is a snitch, now we are learning about it, mm -hmm. yes. Um, solidarity that was 10 million people. And I remember one very short documentary, there was a series of two minutes, just documentaries, and witnesses are saying um, things like that. Uh, one lady in Gdańsk said that when representatives from the government came in one bus, to the docks, shipyard in Gdańsk, 
when everything was happening. People were on strike. They were scared, scared to death, because they had no idea what would happen. They will be torn in pieces, or how this will turn out. But the crowd was silent. And I see in Ireland and in Poland, they are, most of the people are good and kind. Unfortunately in Poland, because uh, we are suppressed and, and we cannot say that, that we won uh, over communism, communism is still ruling those people, children of people who were killing Polish patriots, they are in charge, they are in power, they are consisting elite, like you will say in North Korea. The system in North Korea, it will be difficult uh, to, to crash because there are many people who support it. There's also some things in interest of, of some neighboring countries. And people don't know how this will end. Um, when um, Mr. Brown mentioned Norway and NARS, um, I remember about Leibniz Round. That was a project done, done by Hitler that and they created 10 houses like that in, in Germany, but 13 in Norway, where children were, which were born were given to government. You can see this, um, like, like you were talking about it, how it's easy to brainwash, manipulate children when they are young. We uh, in Poland know the history of one Russian boy who gave away his own parents. Um, for hiding just some food to survive because he was brainwashed and told that it's not good but because people should give everything to the country. We call them the first communist saint. Um, and coming back to this, how these things are working in Ireland? Because I see many people, they don't want bad things to happen. And how is it like that when it is coming to Parliament uh, to legislation, things are getting complicated. Uh, people are discussing not what should be done, what is decent, what is right. But people are saying, oh, those politicians, they have difficulties. They cannot say this or that because they are here, there. They have some commitments or policy is like this or like that. Somehow this, this gets lost. How is it like that those people who created first vigil, those people who are anti-lifers, um, they managed to gather 2,000 people and I was shocked and very much upset uh, hearing, uh, seeing on, on, for example, YouTube afterwards that there was a vigil in New York and their friends of Irish anti-lifers in New York, they were shouting that people should know, not, not go to holidays to Ireland. Mm -hmm. This kind of pressure is put on Ireland. Mm -hmm. I had heard <coughs> and I was very much upset hearing on, on radio some person calling Irishman and uh, saying something like, it's no more proud to be Irish. Hmm. How people are made to think um, uh, because of this case, which was manipulated, which, which uh, I, I'm also sad for, for this family, they, they let themselves to get involved in this, in, in this, all this campaign uh, for abortion. Can maybe, you know, you say, how could this be happening in Ireland? Two things that I want you just to consider. One is that we have no leaders. No leaders. And, and why have we no leaders? People look at Enda Kenny and say, oh, well, that's a leader. But he's not a leader. Because the party system in Ireland means that in order for you to rise to the top of the party, you have to be the party's best follower. Mm -hmm. You have to be the one who has been willing to compromise the most. So the person who is willing to follow, the mo follow, compromise, give away everything, is the one that rises to the top. <coughs> so they don't suddenly rise to the top, the best follower, and become a leader. You know, if they were a leader, they would never have gotten up through yeah. the party. True. Parties start with leaders, but very after not very long, parties demand followers. People, yes people. So it's the best yes people who get to be the leaders, so they're, but they're not leaders. And so that's an inherent problem we have with our political parties here in Ireland. The other problem that I really don't think people see, and I didn't see it, and I say that because I didn't see it when I was in Ireland. I saw 
Fianna Gael, Fianna Fáil, Labour, Sinn Féin, Irish parties. It wasn't until I was in Brussels and realised they're not Irish parties. Labour is European Socialist. Fianna Gael is European People's Party. Sinn Féin is GUI. Um, uh, sorry, Fianna Fáil was in its own little group, but now they're Aldi, which was always their natural home, liberal, democratic liberals. And, but it's more than that. Um, these parties are trans-European, they're across Europe. So that the Labour Party, it's not about what the Irish people want anymore. I mean, in the past, you know, they'd raise the price of children's footwear and the Irish people get out in the streets and the government would fall. Yeah. It was responsive. Now it's not responsive because all they have to respond to is what the European socialist strategy across yeah. Europe is. Yeah. So they're more worried about what the, whichever the socialist party yeah. is in, in Poland <coughs> has more effect or, you know, well, in uh, Belgium actually, or anywhere else, or Italy, than the people of Ireland have on the Labour Party. They are not representing us. No. <laughs> they are representing the Euro co-hosts. Mm -hmm. To us. <laughs> to us. Yes, and this is a big problem. And people don't, we keep voting thinking they're Irish parties, and they're not Irish parties. And this is the other thing. You look at Enda Kenny, or James O'Reilly, or Rory Quinn, and you think that's our Minister for Education, our Minister for Health, our Taoiseach. But they're not. Their first job is as a member of the European Council of Health Ministers, mm -hmm. or the European Council of Education Ministers, mm -hmm. or the European Council, in the yeah. case of Andy Kenny. That's his first job. Yeah. He then has to then represent that to us. Yeah. Yeah. So we actually have completely lost uh, you know, and the, 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 what we have left in democracy is our right of referendum. Mm. And that's don't why... Don't waste... And don't, that's why... No, no, wait a don't, second. But don't waste me. your precious right to referendum, to vote over something, just elect a king. Elect a king. Well, no, I but, hear but just, wait a second, can I just finish there? And the, the problem is that that was supposed to be designed in the first constitution as something that we decided. And I was thinking about it. I started, I came here and, you know, kind of registered my citizenship, which I had since my birth, in the, in the 70s. And yet I've always voted no, <laughs> except once. Now, we'll take out the Good Friday Agreement, because I can't remember how I voted. <laughs> it almost everybody voted yes, I just don't. But, and that, that was different, there was something, you know, because that was kind of a full island thing, so I'm not sure. But every referendum, I voted no, except one, but every referendum since I started voting came from government, or from mm -hmm. Europe, except one. Only one referendum actually came from the people. Which was? The, the life one uh -huh. in 1983. And, uh -huh. and I remember because oh, there, there were three elections and it finally got to the point that nobody who wouldn't promise that referendum was electable. We actually mm -hmm. caused three elections, the petitions, the door to door. That was a hard slog. It, it was the only referendum in all my time that came from the bottom up, mm -hmm. right? And so it was the only one I voted yes in, and it isn't because I even thought about it, it's just that every time I've been faced with a referendum, I've realized this is taking something away from us. Mm -hmm. This is taking a freedom, this is mm -hmm. taking a bit of our power and giving it to government, and I always yeah. say no to that, right? So the only time I said yes was when we actually gained something. Yeah. And so right now our problem has been that in all the referendums, since around 1996, the government has cheated. <laughs> They've used taxpayers' money. So we're finally, thank you, Mark McChrystal. Yeah. We're finally, and many unsung and unnamed people who, who helped on that, we are finally saying we're not going to tolerate cheating anymore. And the government is in court starting on March 7, 16th, in a full hearing, they're going to have to come and sit in witness boxes and explain why they yeah. cheated the Irish people, why they took their money and cheated them out of their most important sovereign 
right of referendum. And if we win that, and I want you all, anybody who can come to it, everybody's welcome, anybody can come to the court, etc. April 16th it starts. Anyone who, please spread the word, because if we don't win that, what's the future? Hmm. The future is, I mean, they have so many referendums rolled up with this constitutional yes. convention. We will just roll over and have one after the other, which we will pay to be defrauded. If we win it, we have a real hope of regaining some of our sovereignty, our power to determine our constitution. So watch this space, pray for it, support it, and um, absolutely let the government know and let the High Court know and let the Supreme Court, because if we win, it'll go to the Supreme Court. If we lose, it'll go to the Supreme Court. Yeah. So let those courts know that we're watching. Is, second, just, just it's, it's very important because we learned recently in Poland that our um, election committee servers they were in Russia. Yes, um, and when I went for this vigil, I spoke to one lady. She has friends in America. She said that they were three times they were voting. It was electronic voting. Three times they were voting for somebody else, and Obama was coming. Not of the choice. <laughs> And when I came here, twice I, I took part in election and I've seen uh, that um, you, you were filling those cards with a pencil. And I actually ask uh, why it is pencil, not a pen, not a biro. Because they cannot it, have the biro. I was about to ask who has a rubber. <laughs> well, no, I know from having once won an election by two votes and watching what recounts. If somebody was rubbing it out, you'd see it. I mean, they, they actually had, uh, oh. you, know, spa, you know, magnifying glasses and everything. So I, I don't think they're rubbing them out, but I mean, should, I'm sure there's other things they can do. But just one quick thing, and I only say it very quickly. The Constitutional Convention are going to recommend a couple of things we have to reject. One is the list system. Because Europe has already <laughs> demanded, I have sat in the committee meetings of the Constitutional Affairs and watched them demand that Malta, Cyprus, and Ireland go on a list system. Because as, if you're not on a list system, independents can be elected, new parties can be elected, people can have a say. They want us on a list system because then the parties, the European parties, can control elections. Yeah. Resist list systems at all stages. They also want us to get rid of, we have an incredible right, and people laugh at it, but this thing about the mother and the mother, that no mother can be forced out of mothering for want, for financial necessity, yes. very important in fighting the eugenic thing. Um, and there's another election thing they want. Um, <laughs> but anyway, don't give them anything. Don't <laughs> give them anything. <laughs> Uh, just a question for you, Ms. Boschetti. Um, you know, we see our politicians, they don't seem to have much influence, but as you're saying about the European Parliament, but can you put names on these people, the, these global elite, who are they, like who are, how do they get such influence over our politicians and why do they have so much power? Like, it seems... Well, if you want to know who has power, just follow the money. Who has power in Ireland? <coughs> the European <coughs> Central Bank, the, you know... Power. Yeah, but it's the... <coughs> Is there names on the ones that, I mean, I just said it it's not, like, I, mean, I know we say God and we have faith like God's in ultimate control and all that, and he's well, allowing I'll it. I'll tell you just one little story, okay, because I think that usually the people that are out front are not the people that are. For six months in the parliament, I was a president, okay, just for six months. Um, and it happened to be just when we voted no to Lisbon. So I would be sitting there with the other seven presidents, group presidents, you know, the socialists, whatever. And everybody hated me, right, in the room. But they would still have to discuss because the conference of presidents is where they discuss how you get past the citizens and, you know, how are you going to get this in. And there was no question ever that our no was going to be allowed to block Lisbon, ever. It, they never missed a beat. It was just how they were going to get around it. Yeah. And I could tell you last stories, but it's already late. But um, um, who? I didn't never thought that anybody in the room was anything but 
people that other people put in place. But one little story, when Lisbon came in, one of the provisions is that uh, the European, the, the president of the commission and the president of the council will meet with, um, you know, just on a sort of a consultative, you know, this consultative thing, make them feel like they've been heard sort of thing. Um, we'll meet with all the major religious bodies, social bodies, etc. But major religious bodies. It's in Lisbon there. So, for the Catholic Church, it's Camis, for the various Protestants, you know, etc. So they all met. But for the first time, President Barroso was meeting with um, the Humanist and the Masons for the first time. It was quite historic. But what was really interesting, a little article in Parliament magazine was about how this was going to be so special first for Barroso. Now, Barroso is supposedly a Portuguese Catholic, right? But how this is going to be such a treat for Barroso because it's the head of his lodge, is the head of the European, the one representing European masonry to Barroso. Yeah. So it was just a little, you know, just a little article like that saying, you oh, know, this will be really nice for him. So, yeah. how did Barroso become the president of the commission, I ask yeah. you? Unelected, I believe, yeah. Well, unelected, yes. Where will exactly. I find it? Where what? will I find it? It, it was the... Parliament magazine, and it was just a little snippet, you know, just on a lot of ah. things, new things with Lisbon. Just Great. a little article. Yeah, uh, of course, because this is, this is uh, the, the elephant in, in the zoo that we are not mentioning <laughs> tonight. Well, uh, everybody's walking around the zoo and uh, we are discussing all the animals there uh, but the elephant <laughs> but the elephant how come uh, at the same time in uh, uh, several different countries uh, parliaments uh, hurry to uh, to stretch uh, uh, the concept of marriage right in poland in france in britain how to well, uh, 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 how to bend uh, and stretch the law so that uh, no longer mother and father are, <laughs> uh, 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 are a married couple, right? Uh, well, another example is, is children's rights. Are yeah, all of the sudden yeah, being at put the in same everything? time? At the same time. So, of course, this is not uh, not fully understandable if we don't mention uh, the long and evil tradition of uh, anti-Catholic, anti anti-Polish <laughs> organizations uh, that uh, that are called Freemasonry uh, and uh, it is it is <coughs> you asked about power who's in power yeah, were so right so so, so my my favorite answer is power is either sacred or secret yeah. either sacred or secret since in democracy Nothing is sacred ever because we can vote anything, right? We can vote uh, that uh, marriage is, uh, you know, you and me and and uh, two other guys. Uh, next week we can vote over this question. So nothing is sacred, and then it is secret because we don't know who's in power here. We don't know who's in power in Poland. The one thing that is for sure that we know that uh, these guys who are being presented to us as our ministers, our prime ministers, our president, these guys are certainly not in power because from time to time we can observe uh, how they uh, make decisions and then uh, have to withdraw, <laughs> have to withdraw because overnight somebody talked to them, right? So, but somebody else is in power here and uh, did it, did it, did it, since democracy is their invention yeah. is their tool mm. <laughs> is there is there there it's 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 their specialty <laughs> to play us with democracy giving us uh, uh, you know the saying that uh, if if democratic voting could change anything it would long ago be forbidden right <laughs> so so just, okay. let's let's face it let's face it if we want to save family if we want to save the church mm. if we want to save our nations 
we we have to to say goodbye to democratic uh, uh, nice nice talking because 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 this will end there is uh, Leonard Cohen's song I've seen the future baby it is murder it is murder I'd have to, I'd have to disagree with you though I have to say no I mean I think that we can get or people can get caught up too much in conspiracies I think it's blunt uh, the, the agenda that is if before us in Ireland anyway is just I mean it's there there's government there's media that want abortion um, that want to foist anti-family values on us so there's no big conspiracy it's there in front of us and it's it's there to be tackled and, and the, other, the other side of it as well I think with democracy I think democracy as it stands is, is the only um, viable option for us at the moment there's nothing else that is there that is um, to, to supersede it now on well, that I'm, I'm a monarchist right now yeah. I'm a monarchist well, I have no king well, but I'm yeah. loyal to my future king no you know the, the yes. thing of it too when we talk about democracy uh, we're using a kind of a very big bur there's a very big difference between a republic which is what Ireland is which is has a democratic form of voting, but it's based on principles, which is the Constitution, and that's called a republic, mm. as opposed to a democracy, <coughs> which is just ruled by majority. If you can get one more than fifty percent, it doesn't. You know, there's no principles. It's but you based can on. change your Two, constitution. Yeah, but what's completely different is what they call democracy in Europe, which isn't democracy at all. I mean, I, I just give you one example. Uh, when it came to the embryo you know, and um, what was called the Advanced Medicines Directive. And this was a directive about things like stem cell, etc. And we were fighting a big battle for the embryo. I would have been what was called a shadow. So for my group, I was in charge of that piece of legislation. And each, each group had someone in charge. Um, so for almost a year, I was in and out of what are called shadow meetings. You know, we'd look at the amendments and we'd fight, 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 blah, 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 blah. And a few days before, it was probably a Thursday, and the next week we were going to be in Strasbourg. So on Tuesday, we were probably voting on it. We had, it was during the German presidency, you had four people from the presidency came, from the council, four people from the commission. Interestingly enough, of course, the four people from the council were all German because they had the presidency, <laughs> but the four people from the commission were all German as well. <laughs> Don't ask me, but that they were just in the part of the commission that dealt with advanced therapies. And of the shadows, four of them were German. Don't ask me how that happened. But anyway, we're all across the table, and we're really fighting the battle that certain amendments are da-da-da-da. And the commission and council made it absolutely plain that it didn't matter how the parliament voted, the embryo was not going to be protected. Yeah and cloning and these things were not going to be banned. And so finally it got, went back and forth, and I finally said, look, can we be absolutely clear here? Yeah. We'd done a year's work lobbying. We knew the name of every MEP who was, who was undecided. We had really gone to every office. And I said, are you telling us that whatever way we vote next week doesn't matter? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And he said, well, I don't like to put it that way, but no. The commission and the council will never accept that. Matters only now, as, as it happened, as we yes. lost the vote. We lost yeah. the vote by 15 votes. The key vote was 15 votes out of whatever, 700. We lost. But had we won it, it would have been sent back. Yeah. And then we would have had to have two-thirds majority. And then if we had managed that, as we did with an incineration vote, actually, yeah. then they'd have taken it away and they'd have had <coughs> what they call this try something or other and they'd have just negotiated all night, and in the morning, the commission would have gotten its way. Hmm. So we were never going to be allowed to protect the embryo or ban cloning research or chimera or animal human hybrid. <coughs> so that's not democracy, even in terms of 51 means it goes, 49 means it doesn't. Right? In 1989 or in 1990, a grand uh, master of uh, some Italian uh, lodge came to Poland 
for the first time after uh, we uh, uh, said goodbye to uh, to hardline communism. Uh, as it was said, uh, keeping most of the guys uh, still in power, right? Maybe not officially. Anyway, uh, he comes to Poland, this Italian guy, Giuliano di Bernardo, I remember his, his name, and it was also published in some paper, so it was not something that somebody heard somebody else saying, but it was officially published. And he says, in 1990, he says, uh, uh, oh, uh, the only thing, and uh, uh, well, number one concern that Freemasonry has to observe uh, is to prevent this vacuum that uh, was created after uh, communism collapsed or had to withdraw, had to withdraw. Uh, the only thing we have to present from, uh, uh, prevent from happening is uh, uh, the Catholic Church to, to uh, uh, redesign this or to occupy this vacuum. Well, he said that. Uh, and uh, it is, uh, this is reality. This is, this is no conspiracy. They are no, no longer conspiring <laughs> uh, such things. They are, they are not hiding their, their uh, real objectives and their real goals. And uh, I think <laughs> that we have, we have to face the reality. Uh, we, Poles, and you, Irish, we are not... We are not uh, 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 they are not fighting us. They are fighting our church that is still relatively safe between us, right? But to say, but to this say, is, yeah. but to say it's Freemasonry is just letting the likes of Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil and the rest of them off the hook. That's to, right. You know, it's, it's, well, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's an age-old problem. I mean, the Fianna, Fianna Fáil is a Fianna Gaelers. Um, if you, I don't know too much about Freemasonry, but if they have all these different ideas, Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael have the same. Like Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael well, have anti-life and anti-family well, agendas. Yeah. And, and so there's no conspiracy, it's in the yeah. open, and yeah. they, they want us to, they want yeah, to vote. In, in my story, I'm, I didn't mean to say that Freemasonry runs the EU. It yeah. may, it may not. <clears throat> I just meant to say, that's how I know how Barroso got his job. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, I suddenly see where he got his job. I don't know Von Rumpy. Uh, mm, according to I, Nigel Farage, Van Rumpy had a nice dinner the day before he was named as a complete surprise, whatever the president of the council. I, I really it's cannot I cannot mm. cannot understand how one can hope to use the mechanism, the tool designed to kill us, to crush us, to, to annihilate us. <laughs> uh, how one can hope to use the same tool for good purposes. So European democracy <laughs> was, was a machinery designed by Freemasonry <laughs> to kill the Pope, <laughs> uh, to kill the Pope. <laughs> uh, at first it was Kind of difficult, so so at first they had to to get rid of of the Pope's knights, that is kings, <laughs> right? Mm. And they did it, uh, and and it was it was openly spoken in the 18th century, in the 19th century, in the 19th century uh, uh, during the uh, French Commune uh, in in Paris, uh, the Freemasons of uh, uh, mm, uh, of France uh, they. Thought that, uh, uh, that uh, that was it. They were so glad, and they thought that the French Commune was uh, was really uh, well uh, uh, a dream coming true. <laughs> so they uh, they went out uh, with their banners and with their uh, uh, costumes, uh, and uh, they because they thought that. That is it, <laughs> right? They were wrong because, of course, this is not the only the only factor that uh, has to be taken under consideration. But, the, but it is democracy it, was a lot uh, there long long time. The, 
the historian there be able to tell us that the democracy, I mean, even the Dominicans in the, the 13th century, you know, they, they would have been, their constitution is, you know, so a democracy. Probably, uh, I mean, go back to the Greeks, you know. Probably the Dominicans uh, and other Catholic uh, gatherings, mm. uh, 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 probably this is the only case mm. uh, uh, in which we can say that democracy uh, works for a very limited scale for a very limited <laughs> scale but uh, for uh, uh, such a large scale mm. as as a nation and mm. each nation really needs uh, a state because we, if we don't have our <laughs> ours mm. then uh, uh, somebody else's state's uh, state but if, comes uh, well but if, the, but if you have a monarchy you get rid of the principle of subsidiarity because subsidiarity <laughs> is allowing you, you if you let the if you take subsidiarity in it is in its real context you let the, you, you give the power right back to the locals, ah. right back to the localities, and I mean I think the wor- the root word of subsidiarity is to help. So okay. you, you're there at the very very local level, helping pe- and letting people elect their representatives. I don't want to to switch the subject of yes. this of this gathering. But I think we uh, we need to meet again and discuss monarchy and, yes. and democracy. Uh, but uh, 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 well, think about it. It's the power. It's it's either sacred or secret. Yeah. And <laughs> which one do you prefer to face? Well, of course, with regards to the polls, of course, they had the elected king had the best of both worlds. So. <laughs> well, that's, well I'm, I'm not in favor uh, of of this kind of of monarchy. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Of course. Thanks <laughs> yeah. very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just a, a quick observation there on the film. Uh, years ago, I was looking up to go out with an Italian girl, and she used to remark how there were so many handicapped people in Ireland, yeah. and she came to the conclusion that it was bad diet, too many potatoes, and too much alcohol. That was <laughs> <laughs> this film explains to me why. Why? Why? We don't yeah. Here and that yes. in yeah. Other European countries they do. So. Yeah. I, I remember yeah. in in the Parliament we had a some type of conference on uh, about disability, and in fact, quite a lot of the groups represented were Irish. But a Lithuanian woman who worked for the Parliament actually commented that she had never seen a disabled yes. person until she came to Belgium. <laughs> had never seen. Of any description, mm-hmm. till she came to Belgium. Yeah. Um, we have one uh, martyr, um, priest uh, Popiewuszko. Yeah. When he was asked um, by someone to name the people um, who are in power, in charge, and doing the wrong things, that someone told him, "Oh, it's the right time." He answered uh, with surprise, looking at the people, you are with me for so long time, and don't you understand that I fight with evil, not the victims of evil? Another answer for this question, when I ask after a couple of years um, being away from Poland, uh, I ask, who is now ruling? I got an answer. Everyone is drinking together. (laughs) I would rather believe that there will be groups of people who are in power, this is changing, And I, I believe the only way it is this what we can do, like in Poland, 10 million peaceful people yeah. who says no, who says no, we won't do it. Like <coughs> communists started in Russia, uh, so many people got afraid and started doing wrong things. The same one famous bishop was telling like um, how it happened. He's still surprised that this kind of things happen in his beloved Germany. Uh, first, uh, Nazi people, they were fighting with these groups, that groups. He was not belonging to them. When they, but when they came after Catholic Church, it was too late. And I've seen a beautiful example in Ireland, Listowel um, Mutiny, that when, before inter- independence, um, uh, Britishers came to uh, Kerry, to Irish police, and they wanted them to be guides for British troops and go from house to house, kill. Opposition, which can mean everyone. Those people refused. First, there was a meeting of 15 top officials, 
uh, which was also very nice. Uh, they said, two of them, you have huge families, you don't get involved, but those people signed the document, refuse doing so. And it was, those times they were much more difficult, harder. Yeah. When about getting job, whatever, harder to survive, 1,400 people joined them. So this is what I see, the only solution. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, and I think if you go and look at something like the Federalist Papers in, in the US. And it's very, very clear democracy, well, in this case, a republic, so democratic <laughs> methods based on principle, only work as long as the people, the demos, are of strong character, you know, moral strong moral character. And as the demos lose their strong moral character, it doesn't work. And that's the problem. You know, who do you blame? Who's really behind it, etc.? Well, it's us when we take an easier road, when we don't. You know, why is it so easy? I remember the guy who ran against me, he just went around. I was on so many debates with him where he never said anything coherent. He just went, jobs, jobs, jobs. Jobs, jobs, jobs. And I was like, an MEP can't get anybody a job. They mm -hmm. can't, you know, barring maybe two office workers. But, you know, they, they don't, they don't create jobs, they don't, you know, you maybe fight to protect them. You do actually fight, particularly in farming and fishing. But, um, but I knew he wasn't going to because he would be a socialist and they don't. They make more regulation and lose more jobs all the time. But he just walked around saying jobs, jobs, jobs. And the thing is that I think before, maybe this is my own theory and I could be absolutely wrong, but before television, yeah. I think that we would have examined that. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Well, how are you going to make a job? Like, what is, you know, da, 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 da. But we're so trained on suspended disbelief. We're so trained to spend, you know, an hour here, two hours there, you know, in fairyland, you know, believing, you know, because, you know, believing Tom Cruise isn't Tom Cruise, he's really so-and-so, and, you know, this guy now is somebody else and we we've learned we're so used to suspending disbelief hmm. we're so used to hmm. all accepting what we want to hear and not looking beyond it that i think that's the problem with democracy or republic is that we have lost our character our discernment our insisting on the truth our willingness to work and to do it you know, someone says, oh, we'll give you bread and circuses, and we're like, yes. Well, we should be saying, well, no, not at the cost of losing our families. Not at the cost of, you know, whatever. But we don't do that because now we're, we've become very soft. We've become very, you know, we want to believe what we want to hear. So all politicians have to do is massage us, flatter us, etc., and we vote for them. So... If democracy is failing, it's we that are failing in our characters, because we keep putting them there. Can I just say something? We, we, I won't yeah, tell you for much longer. Yeah. just want to say that what has been used on the Irish people in a number of referendums in the last few years is fear. Basically fear. And you're talking about how we're controlled. People should turn off that box in the corner. If you want to control the population, you let them watch television. And this is the biggest thing. This is a mass mind control. And this is very serious. Children are looking at this and they think what's happening is real. It's not. Yeah, so it's easy to make people afraid or it's easy to make yes, people... Yes, it yeah, is. It's easy to do anything. And that's what they have been doing. They've been playing on the fears of the Irish people. Or if you don't vote this way, you'll have no job. That's right, and you vote that way and you don't have any job. <laughs> and then you forget that the next election. Uh, it's kind of back onto the euthanasia thing more closely. You know, my, my, my daughter survived abortion back in 1985, and there's a good few people know about that. Um, we say going through the thing, first off, I was tricked into um, giving a signature on the basis of signing so for something else. So they had, they did a, a saline infusion and she survived it. So they were then caught in a bad situation. They needed to go again. 
So I copped on to what they were, well, roughly copped on to what they were at. I actually forced the truth out of them that they were trying to abort. Uh, no, that didn't happen. And uh, I convinced them to, uh, with some difficulty, because they were in a tough situation, obviously, because there was going to be a, a deform there was going to be deformity from the procedure. So they were particularly keen to go ahead. Uh, I actually dissuaded them from doing it by, uh, as it turns out, rather oddly, I, I go to the eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And I, I don't think it was scripture I had in mind either when I, when I was saying it. Um, but in the aftermath of it all, I mean, it was a hellish experience and she's fine, she's come through and she's grand. But only more recently I was kind of looking at a thing and looking at it from afar, you know, because it was obviously a thing I was deeply kind of tied up in. But I've come to realize that we say the reason why they wanted, or they were so keen to um, perform this procedure is it was a rhesus factor problem, um, hemolytic condition, a rhesus negative like and positive. Mm -hmm. And that applies to um, a goodly percentage of Irish people and Basques, as it turns out, I know, you know and Basques as well as it turns out. So there it goes into the, into the fluoride again, you know. But um, this happened in 1985, and it's, I've only very recently found out that this blood problem, they didn't want to give blood because there was a problem with um, hepatitis C and supposedly HIV in the blood supply. Um, they knew that, and they tried to use the threat of giving, wife, giving blood to my wife to persuade me to sign off on an abortion. No, I did, obviously didn't. And uh, but what I've come to realize more recently is that even though this happened in 85 and they were fully aware of it, they had known about it since 1974. Hmm. And they still didn't come out and go public about it until 1994. So it went on for a full 20 years. You know, I mean, what I ran into was a very well-practiced machine, basically, at persuading <coughs> to sign the dotted line. And I only wonder how many people did. There was bound to have been an awful, awful lot of them. So I, I think it's reasonable to assume that there's been an awful lot of abortions in this country in relation to this blood thing. And it comes back to the question somebody was asking earlier, who's in charge? I mean, you go there, who's in charge there? Well, the Rockefellers. Yeah. Uh, Rockefellers control the blood transfusion and the blood products industry, so they're in charge there. There was somebody taken before the courts, and the matter, I think the case collapsed. And she was asked to uh, account for her thing. She was the person in charge, uh, Cunningham, I believe her name was. And why did she continue to use the blood products? <coughs> and she said, because nobody told her to stop. <laughs> you know, I mean, in all fairness, if that's what we have in charge, there's something seriously wrong, you know? But it's obviously, it looks to me anyway, like a kind of a euthanasia thing directed at a section of, of the population of this country, because uh, Reese negative has a very high uh, proportion of uh, Reese negative people in this country, and it, it applies to them all. So there must have been widespread killing. And you know, if it's not planned, I mean, I've seen there's too much, there's too many things, too many coincidences. And when there when there's so many coincidences, they're not coincidences at all. You know. Yeah. So that's all I'd say. Thank you. I'm surprised to hear that because um, what I have heard about this condition since a long time that it's possible to just to change something about some factors and, and there is no problem. It, it should have been probably, you see, my daughter was at 30 weeks that time, so there would have been no problem delivering her either. They went ahead to try to kill her. So they, they, they just wanted to kill him. Yeah, that's another shocking thing. Yeah. And another thing which uh, I'm concerned about is many laws introduced to kill the kindness. Uh, like, for example, in Poland a couple of years ago, it was uh, suddenly forbidden to give um, a businessman, baker, for example, he was not allowed to give for charity some bread which was just one day old. And many examples like that which are 
making people to be afraid of each other. Someone mentioned about uh, recently raising in Poland a subject of um, pedophiles that, oh, it can happen, uh, that could be someone in the family, um, raising awareness, but in such a way that it is making people to, to be afraid, to be accused of something or to, to be more afraid of each other. Well, it's been spoken of, uh, it's been proclaimed this, this, uh, yeah. this goal. Uh, the family itself is supposed to be forbidden. <laughs> the family is supposed to be forbidden. That is, it's going to be uh, uh, the state's decision who is entitled to, who is who's supposed to, to have babies uh, and who's not. Uh, and they are, they are saying this. Uh, again, <laughs> a very, very prominent official Freemason in Poland uh, uh, very recently uh, uh, said that uh, it is not right uh, uh, to procreate uh, without, uh, well, proper knowledge uh, and proper uh, uh, preparation, right? So, so it's, it's nothing new. Right? Nothing new, because they came up with such ideas centuries ago, and they are, they are sticking to, to uh, their ideas because they know that uh, to, to build their, uh, their tower, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, their, and this tower, I'm afraid, is a republic in their dreams. <laughs> they have to, to dismantle, they have to destroy uh, normal families, normal regular nations and our church. Our church. That's what they aim for. Uh, so, so, once again I raise uh, my doubt uh, whether the Republic uh, can give an answer to to this threat, deadly threat. Well, the Republic can't do anything without citizens with character and moral character. So, so. <clears throat> I don't think any form of government will will be successful without citizens with normal with moral character. Which begs the question: Do we get what we deserve? <laughs> Yeah. We get what we have, so to me, they're putting that stuff in the water. And to have people are, are, are particularly useless in the water. To have and people with have character, people you have to have families you know, to raise them, that's right? right? That's and absolutely. the church and the nation uh, right. to, to, uh, to make them uh, grow right. up safely. Right. Right. So the circle closes, and and I think one day this circle has to be cut by some some king's sword. <laughs> Thank you very much. I was honored to see. Next to you. Thank you.